Welcome to Conversations with Chamomile. This is your host, Jacob Lyles. Join me as we explore life together. Hi, friends. Welcome back to another conversation. Um, I'm continuing my series on religious journeys and conversions, those who converted to religion as adults. Uh, today, I'm talking with Mike Elias. Mike Elias, you can find his work at MikeElias.com, is a uh, currently a crypto entrepreneur, and he has a newsletter as well and thoughts on spirituality on his website. Mike was born into a uh, somewhat secular Jewish home, and he traveled through Eastern spirituality and eventually, through much heartbreak and a long path, found his way to Jesus Christ. Uh, in this interview, which I found to be very inspiring and heartwarming, we talk about his long journey to find a home. Now, with most of these interviews, I am starting to discover a pattern. Sort of the first half, we talk about, uh, go over the, the spiritual biography of the person, and then Towards the second half of the program, we have time for more general comments and advice for spiritual seekers. Uh, this conversation certainly follows that format. So if you, uh, if you want to hear more of those general um, kind of conversation topics, you can skip to the end. And I hope this won't be my last conversation with Mike. I really enjoyed talking with him. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Thanks for coming. Hi, Mike. Uh, Thank you for coming on the show. And um, I think maybe we should start by, uh, could you introduce yourself for my audience? Sure. I'm Michael Elias. I'm the founder of Idea Market. It's a crypto protocol that allows the public to decide what information and voices are worth uh, widespread attention using market signal instead of having media corporations and governments decide on your behalf what deserves attention and what kind of narratives and information are legitimate. Fascinating. Fascinating. Okay. This isn't um, a tech podcast, but it sounds a little bit like uh, if I can be indulged, um, it sounds like a prediction market kind of applied to like current events. It is kind of similar to a prediction market in the sense that you can make money by being right about things that are not exclusively financial. But it's very different in the way that it operates. It's much more like a commodities market because it doesn't close and there are no oracles. There's no need to uh, decide with finality uh, the truth about anything. It's really just about tracking public opinion in a way that generally rewards carefulness and punishes carelessness um, in the way that uh, markets markets tend to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, fascinating. Um, so. Uh, I'll probably, you know, go and check that out later just because it sounds like it's in my wheelhouse. I'm a awesome. bit of a, a, a crypto professional as well. Um, but, uh, you know, I wanted to have you on to talk about um, religious journeys. Um, and uh, like I've said already, probably in the intro to this episode, uh, I'll probably mention that this is my series on people coming to a religious faith uh, as an adult. Um, so... I always think the best place to start is maybe on how you grew up, like get a little bit of background on like sort of the template and context that you were working with. Sure. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'm Jewish. Both my parents are Jewish. All four of my grandparents are Jewish. And two of them, both of my dad's uh, parents survived the Holocaust. So there's a deep connection to the suffering of of Jews uh, throughout their history, but especially their recent history. And uh, my, I think both my parents did 23andMe, and I'm, based on their results, I'm 99.8% Ashkenazi Jewish or something like that. So like, uh, blood-wise, a uh, pretty, pretty darn Jewish. So, so you're but, pretty Jewish, is yeah. what I'm hearing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, but but I want to I want to distinguish that I was never uh, incredibly practicing. My family 
was never very practicing in that regard. We did the fun stuff. We did Hanukkah. I went to Temple for Yom Kippur a couple of times. Um, but the primary quality of my Jewish experience was just being different from everyone else around me in, in Ohio and Cincinnati. Hmm. Do, do you think uh, like that, it, that being different influenced you in any way? Yeah, I, I learned to treat it to a, appreciate being different as a strength very early on. And maybe that was kind of an, an innate personality trait of mine or uh, a trait that I acquired some other way. But I always got a kick out of, you know, when I would tell kids in school that I was Jewish, they would say, I've heard of you in legends. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a mystical being, or you know, magical creature uh, to my blonde haired classmates. Hmm. And um, yeah, so I, you know, I've, I always felt very good about it. I never really encountered anti-Semitism to speak of. And it, it always was a point of pride, really. Now, um, your parents and your kind of social group, like, did you guys spend a lot of time with other Jews? Like, was, was that kind of like, did you hang out with the other Jewish kids or, uh, or anything like that? There weren't really a ton around when I was a child. Um, but my parents did move me from a public school where I was probably the only Jew and maybe 500 kids to a private one where I was one of three of 80 in my you know, co cohort class grade or something like that. So um, we, we made efforts to expose me to more Jews, but they were never uh, abundant in my childhood. It was always, you know, we were always kind of a, a rare thing. Okay. So, um, so you grew up, it sounds like sort of non-practicing Jewish. Uh, was there any education involved as far as like the history of like what you believed or the Jewish theology, history, language, anything like that? Only kind of casually. I had one year of Hebrew school as a seven-year-old, and it just wasn't in an incredibly high priority for my family. And it was all the way across town, so we stopped doing that. And uh, yeah, growing up, it was mostly just about my family's sort of unique set of values and not being involved in... Uh, Christian life, which was kind of the default background against we were. Cool. Um, so how would you describe, like, at what period in, in life did you have your, like, philosophical or religious awakening? Like, when did you start grappling with topics uh, related to existence um, on your own? It was really kind of gradual. I, well, actually, no, let, let's, let's put that another way. I never really thought about religion or God or any of these things until I was maybe 11 or 12. It was not in my family uh, as an important topic, really. And the only reason I started thinking about it, as far as I can recall, was because I was really enjoying George Carlin's comedy. And he loves to pick apart the uh, hypocrisies of religious institutions. And that really spoke to me. So having seen George Carlin's argument about the ridiculousness of organized religion, I thought, all right, that makes sense. I guess I'm an atheist. And I uh, ended up writing that sentiment for uh, a few more years until, uh, well, until things changed. Cool. So, uh, so you got Carlin pilled. Um, and um, let's see, Carlin, uh, he was big in the, in like in the nineties or, so was it about? He had a uh, huge other? career. He was yeah. he was prominent from probably the late sixties, early seventies, all the way up to mm. his death in two thousand seven or eight. Yeah, he was fairly popular even in the two thousands a little bit. Like even at the end of his career, uh, oh, people yeah. like to listen to him. Um, he he does have a a certain kind of uh, like these people that make fun of and and pick at organized religion. I think like even as someone that belongs to an organized religion, like th there's often some truth or like suppressed frustration that they're giving voice to that. Like you can appreciate sometimes the critique, uh, even if you're, um, even if you don't 
you know, swallow the critique and, and, and make that who you are. Um, like there's often yeah. like a, a kernel of truth there. Um, so I, I have my sympathies for these people. And so how did it change? I was 13 in eighth grade and I had been having crushes on girls since I was about five or six years old. And it would it tended to be unrequited. And this was a, just a source of great grief and torment. There was always some girl that I was pining over as a little kid. And she was always just kind of in a different world and mm. the, the connection, you know, really it never quite happened. And I had just asked out some girl in eighth grade and she very, you know, courageously and politely said, you know, no, thank you. And she was very sweet about it. It was not harsh or anything. And it's funny because I actually reconnected with her later about this conversation. And she told me uh, that she had a feeling it was really important that she be honest and straight at that moment. And it turned out that that changed my life. And what happened was I decided I'm not satisfied with the you know results I'm getting here. My heart hurts. I want love. It's not happening. And so I went on the internet and started to research how to become more attractive to women and how mm -hmm. to uh, get a girlfriend and all these things. And I, I became uh, a, a mostly a, well, I wouldn't say a spectator. I became I joined, I joined what would later become called the seduction community. Mm, also known and as within uh, that pickup artist, right? Yes. It became later known. Yeah. That, that, yeah. that term. Yeah. And within that, of course, there's a wide spectrum of, of ethical leanings. And I was always drawn to the more, uh, well, the more, the more honest side of things. And in that it took me to, questions like what does it mean to be a good man what um what does it mean to be authentic because uh, what 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 spoke to me was that it's the men who have the courage to be thoroughly themselves who are sort of congruent between their outer actions and their deep inner convictions and feelings and sense of identity that are attractive because they have the guts not to fake anything. They, um, they really put their inner selves out there and be, are vulnerable in a way that paradoxically makes them very strong. And so when I was maybe 15, I started asking questions about honesty and self-honesty and who am I and how can I be more authentic and stuff like that. And one of the books that was recommended to me was uh, Radical Honesty by mm -hmm. Brad Blanton. Have you heard of this book? Yeah, I've read it. I was a big fan when I first read it. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, me too. And I started to play with it in life. And, you know, I'd be doing something mischievous at high school and I would get caught and some administrator would say, hey, you know, you're not supposed to be doing that. And I would tell him, uh, oh, yeah, I was just doing this mischievous thing. And if you hadn't come along, I would have done this other one, too. And I just wasn't expecting you to be here. You know, that's how mm. that's how it goes sometimes. And every time I would do that, the situation would resolve itself more harmoniously than it would have had I tried to contrive something. And so even as an atheist, I started to get this felt sense that truth is a thing, a force that is good and comes to my aid when I'm faithful to it. Hmm. And at that first, you know, it didn't, didn't even seem to clash with my atheism. I wasn't even thinking that, but I had this sense of truth being a thing that like operates because this was, it was spooky how good the truth was to me. And that sort of emboldened me to pursue truth through scary barriers. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years later, um, I started to 
uh, I was kind of just lying down, I guess. And I said to no one in particular, uh, I don't care what the truth is about whether there's a God. I just want to know. Hmm. I don't, don't care what the outcome is, what the reality is of that. And I started to experience little synchronicities and coincidences that drew me into this idea that there may be a spiritual reality hmm. out there. And I started to meditate and explore. I started to explore the question, what do the wise men of history all tend to agree on? And that often had something to do with God or enlightenment or the self with the capital S and things like that. And so I started to study meditation and things. I've read a book called Course in Consciousness. It's a free textbook by uh, Dr. Stanley Sabatka from the University of Virginia. And this it's, it's free online. And it basically walks you through connections from science and physical science all the way through um, Eastern spiritual wisdom from meditation and sages and things like that and makes very clear and gradual the sort of unity of these of these things and i read in that about ramana maharshi's uh practice of self-inquiry where you just sit and say uh what am i basically mm. and whenever you think you have an answer you ask again well i'm noticing that so I can't be that because I'm noticing that. So what am I behind that? And you just kind of keep doing that and unraveling the onion. And I'm a super beginner, so I have no expectations. And uh, as I was doing that one day, I felt, I felt this big opening. I felt as I breathed that my body was completely hollow and that my breath extended to fill the room and that the room expanded and contracted with my breath. And there was extraordinary peacefulness that was just bigger than me in this and just gratitude bursting from you know, the heart area. And that was the moment that, you know, sealed the deal. And with respect to, all right, there's really something here there's really something to spiritual reality. And that was the first time you tried that exercise? Uh, one of the first, yeah, it was pretty mm -hmm. early on. Yes, so this is quite a, quite a journey, right? From early teenager atheist um, to uh, through heartbreak to uh, some sense that the truth is a thing that exists and now it, it seems like you keep on following your nose through the, through these experiences, um, like searching out first person experience of what's real and what's true. Um, and, uh, and, and that you're very committed to this path. Um, and that, that your quest for the truth, like led you away from sort of simple materialistic, uh, atheism. Yeah. And, something I would say a lot of the time was it was the same desire for truth that led me to atheism, then led me to theism, then led me to spirituality. Because the, the orientation, the curiosity, um, the orientation never changed. It was the same kind of impulse that, that brought forth both conclusions at different times. You see, that's something that I think um, people might underappreciate. Uh, it's like, yeah. I think they might often think like the truth seekers, they're the atheists and then like the theist or the religious people, they're the ones that like need a comforting illusion to, to like get through life. And they don't look too closely at it because, um, they need it, uh, and they don't want it to go away. But, um, that certainly wasn't the case in your story or in, I think in mine. Yeah, absolutely. It was my experience was definitely, and excuse me for a moment because my wife's about to walk through the door. We might hear it. Okay. My experience was definitely that, um, I guess you could say God responded in proportion to 
sincerity in mm-hmm. proportion to curiosity. And this was all on my own. I didn't have any institutions breathing down my neck. I didn't have my parents who were agnostic or atheist themselves. It was all just like a personal, a personal search, a personal thing. Well, um, I don't know. Uh, I haven't quite got to uh, what your current religion is yet, but uh, the script. That's fine. The, we can uh, take our time. The uh, there's a verse in the Bible that says, uh, you know, knock and you shall find. Um, it's kind of uh, one of the words of Christ. And uh, I, I think about that sometimes. When I, or I, I, w- I would give that advice to people on their own spiritual journey. It's like, you know, try things out. Go seeking. Go seeking earnest, earnestly and honestly. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if God is good, you'll find him because he wants you to find him. Um, but, uh, I, well, yeah, this is, this is a nice, so this, this is a nice, uh, sort of, it feels like a halfway point, although I don't know where we're going. Uh, I, you, I know you wrote a spiritual biography on your website and I haven't read it yet. Uh, if you apologize, this is all fresh to me. Um, but, uh, so about what age are we at? Uh, what what time, season in your life are we at? Sure. I'm about mm, 17 when this happens, when this first like breakthrough meditation experience happens. So very and... precocious teenage years uh, in, the, in the spiritual uh, in the spiritual aspect. Uh, yeah, I guess very fortunate. Yeah. Mm. Um, just having... It was, it was probably really the heartbreak and frustration that, that made me really dogged about this path hmm. and, uh, and what it, you know, what it turned into really ended up being wonderful. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, what's the, the next, um, wh- where do we go from here in the story? Sure. So I had been quite an annoying atheist and I would, you know, argue with Christians and just be everything that modern atheists have gotten a bad reputation for, but I was doing it before it was cool. That's what I like to tell people. And um, as a result, discovering that spiritual reality exists was kind of perturbing in in some ways like i was not fully able to just make a switch it was like all right i got this but i didn't actually start using the word god for a couple years because it was such a 180 from what i had been uh preaching up and up until then i would refer to uh consciousness the universe i sound like so many you know hippie type new age people for a while just because that was language that was less embarrassing than, you know, than, than God. And I continued to meditate and read all these spiritual books, you know, Eckhart Tolle, Ken Wilber, David R. Hawkins, Ramana Maharshi, all this, you know, stuff, mostly, um, mostly Eastern, very, you know, meditation and um, firsthand experience based. And didn't really discriminate as to where the inspiration would come from. Uh, just kind of wanted to just, just absorb it, just wanted it. Um, and so I was meditating a lot and experimenting with lots of different uh, things. And I became a big fan of uh, Dr. David R. Hawkins. Are you familiar with his work? I don't think so. What did he okay. write? He wrote Power Versus Force. I happen to have a copy right here. Um, And in it, he describes levels of consciousness. He just like a scale of consciousness of basically spiritual maturity. I do have one of his books. I have, um, I haven't read it, but Letting Go the Pathway to Surrender. Pathway of Surrender is one I have. Right on. So I... I sort of latched on to this uh, levels of consciousness concept as, all right, this is, this is the ladder I have to climb. This is my you know purpose. This is, it just clarified a bunch of things for me. So you, you have like and, a path now, like it's like a map. Yeah. Yeah. And Hawkins, like me, didn't favor any particular uh, religious approach. He kind of 
took all the, he synthesized them in various ways and talk, talked about uh, what they all tend to have in common and uh, described in very sort of analytical terms and very sort of low context, low interpretation terms, what to do and what kind of challenges you might face and things like that. He was very, almost, almost technical in that respect. And it, you know, reflecting upon it now, it makes me think that, you know, the, the autist in me just needed to have things presented that way without mm -hmm. like poetry and stuff, but like specifically this kind of thing. And I've, uh, I've since, you know, lost confidence in, in the levels and calibration stuff that, that he did uh, in a variety of ways. And maybe we can talk about that later. But um, it was very, very empowering for me at the time. And what happened? So what are the, uh, yeah. like, what's, what's the level you're aiming at here? Like, uh, like you're at... I imagine he has like some ladder to ascend and um, like, what's the, what's the, the next step that, that you're aiming at? Is it like to be able to meditate for an hour? Is it to like conquer it to be mindful or what, what's the, well, it's pretty much like enlightenment as talked about by, you know, the Buddhists and Hindus and things like that. That's pretty much the aim. Hmm. Um, but I mean, that's quite hard. That was sure. quite, quite clear that that's, very unusual and hard, but I was kind of, you know, what else is there to do? That's, that's the, that's the thing that matters. I'm going to pursue that. Mm. Um, and let me, you know, try to figure out where I am actually now. Um, I connected with, uh, I connected with a girl in an online forum about not me, not you. And, uh, <laughs> and it was, it was in a, a really a seduction community forum that was very about, uh, meditation and spirituality. And, and there was, a, the, there was a girl there. There were, there were a bunch. Yeah. There were a okay. bunch. But uh, yes, this one I particularly connected well, and she became my first like real long-term girlfriend, and I things were great, and we had lots of you know radical, honest conversations and things like that, and it was really um, nourishing and and great for both of us. And then about a year later, life was just kind of gently unwinding us and pulling us in different directions, and so we broke up. And when we broke up, we were living in different cities, so I didn't have to like see her every day or anything. And one night I cried really just deeply and just, I felt something release. I felt something unlock and I fell asleep and woke up the next morning and Basically, all of my life's insecurities and limitations had just vanished. I leapt out of bed. I had a felt sense of being uh, deeply peaceful and energetic and loving. And I felt like my inner child, I know that's a corny term, but I felt like there was like a four or five-year-old me who was alive inside and just like jumping around, like ready to do stuff. And I wasn't scared of anything didn't feel embarrassed. I just felt a hundred percent in control and creative and I felt forgiven. I felt a sense of inner perfection in a certain respect. And I felt, I felt so forgiven. And it's interesting that that came up that that word struck me at that time. I felt so forgiven that I didn't, I realized I had never known, what it was like. I had never known before how, I guess, guilty, guilt ridden I had felt. And I just felt free, like no sexual shame, no nothing. I was, I was playing guitar just incredibly effortlessly. And 
everything was just amazing. And it was like that for a week and it actually really just kept building and just getting better and blossoming. And after a week, I decided, you know, I will write my ex-girlfriend a letter to tell her what's, what's happened to me here. And so I did. And we got into a, a conversation. And I think what happened was I sort of let myself get reattached to her. Just, I, you know, acted on some feeling of attachment that had been let go of in this transformational experience. And I felt everything kind of crunch back in and close back in. And I became the person that I had been before that transformation. I was really dismayed at this. And uh, I figured, well, last time what caused the transformation was grieving. So I'll just grieve again and transform again and everything will be fine. I'll just undo it. So what, to make a long story short, I made myself cry horribly over and over and over and just tormented myself and it never worked, just made things worse. Mm -hmm. And I was really panicking because I had lost this incredible transformation and I got myself into some kind of self-destructive cycle, just emotionally, just in here. I wasn't doing drugs or anything. And I put myself in this, in this self-destructive cycle and, and torment. And at the end of about a month after that, uh, I checked myself into a behavioral health unit. I checked myself into like what in colloquial terms would be called a mental hospital. No, you, was, you really, uh, you really kind of went through a little volatility spiral there. Dude, it was, it was agonizing. It was mm. absolutely agonizing. And, and this From was all motivated of, like by like the loss of that sweetness that you had felt like you were chasing that the loss of the of the sense of transformation yeah like the transformation came from letting go of of i guess an, an attachment to a certain kind of love or a feeling of lack of a certain kind of love hmm. and it just uh disappeared and i felt complete in a way that i never had ever 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 before and it was abiding. It was not like a peak experience. It was concluded. This was the new reality for me. And the dismay at having forfeited that uh, was, was just, just harrowing, just harrowing. And not only forfeiting it, but in the attempt to get it back, really harming myself deeply and feeling like I could feel like a light like a light bulb or something, the range of my awareness closing in. I could feel myself getting denser. I could feel the lights going out. And that is a terrifying, horrific thing. And that continued just over the course of about a month before I went to a mental hospital and said, you know, I, I don't know what else to do. And I think mostly what, what happened was I, I, uh, performed the ritual of going to a mental hospital. I just mm -hmm. said, you know, I, I said, I'm, I'm done. And, you know, the, it, the descent did not continue incredibly much longer than that. I started taking antidepressants, whatever. I didn't really feel like they helped. But I, I was not this, the person that I had been before, even before the transformation happened. I would watch videos mm -hmm. of myself playing guitar just months ago, and envy myself. What a beautiful, bright being that guy is. I remember when I was him and now I'm just a shell. It, and it'll take fucking lifetimes to get back. I have done extraordinary damage to my soul and it's the only thing that matters to me now. And oh my God, like this is the worst thing ever. It was terrible. And all this is just going on in here. It's hard to explain. I'm from a family of agnostics and, you know, it's kind of a meditator thing. Like I, I had no one to talk to about this really. I mean, therapists, yeah, you technically have people to talk to, but you don't have really have someone to talk to. It was a very solitary kind of a thing. And um, 
I gradually recovered over about two years and, you know, became a person that I could respect again over about two years. And uh, about the time when I was feeling maybe comp comparable to how I had felt when I got into the first relationship, uh, I got into another one. I was feeling vibrant and healthy, very optimistic about life. I had kind of made some peace with, well, maybe I hadn't made peace, but I wasn't just agonizing anymore. I had a plan and a life and stuff to do. And I got into this new relationship and it was with a, um, a very a, a woman who was older than me and very respected in our community and um, in the, in the town that I was living in. And uh, I was very, she's, she's well, well educated in psychology and I felt very flattered that she respected my psychology knowledge. Um, and so we had a, a, uh, a relationship and it was you know apart from the age difference about as normal as the first one about as intimate as the first one it was very honest we were very close like everything was was uh pretty good um but we just kind of lived in different worlds and i had i felt pressured to fake something to kind of be be who be someone that I that I wasn't, and I felt so validated by her that I didn't want to. I, I I feared that if we broke up, I would lose that validation, and so I just kind of endured becoming more and more fake. And then one day I kind of snapped, mm. and the same thing that had happened with that you know downward spiral, this crushing spiritual falling. Uh, a couple of years ago happened again and this time it didn't stop for eight years wow it was it was it was much worse there was no floor hmm. and for uh many years i just had this experience of of um continual disintegration inwardly so um it, 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 definitely noting that in your story, like it's encountering women often is like, is the, is a catalyst for sort of the next stage in. I wouldn't say encountering women, women. definitely not encountering women. Yeah. Like uh, that's, that's safe. Yeah. But. Uh, encountering uh, a relationship, getting tied up. with them. It was, it was, it was, it, yeah, it was the temptation to, I guess um, it was, let me let me let me I'm gonna I want to put this just right. I want to be yeah. careful. So give me a second here. Let's say as an attachment to romantic relationships. Like I would get something from these relationships that I had never been able to get from myself. And therefore, when I was threatened with the loss of those relationships, it felt like a horrific, unendurable thing. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one went well in that it wasn't horrific and unendurable. It actually patched up whatever hole it was it had been filling. It patched up whatever you know void had had been there uh, before, and the second time, uh, I think I just I didn't have the guts or something like just it, I did it didn't do it. I I was still very committed to spirituality and all that, but for whatever reason, I just I prioritized her over my spiritual life, and it caused a, a crisis it's hard to walk um, away from something that's kind of like you know it feels connected that feels comfortable to go out on your own like, even if you notice something's like not quite right about it like i don't know i could never walk away 
I stayed too long probably in my last relationship and it was like, I don't know, how do you walk away? It's cold out there. It's warm in here. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I think it was made harder because uh, this this particular girlfriend being older and more established in life made me feel really special. Hmm. Um, she made me feel like I had just leapfrogged everyone who was my age and I'm now dating someone with credentials. So I kind of have credentials like hmm. by extension and I felt, you know, very distinguished by her. And I think that was part of what made it so hard to leave was I had this new sort of pride and it was, it was large, you know, in a lot of ways, a false and unhealthy pride. I felt like I'm, mm. I'm this fucking, you know, awesome dude. And I had built that image around myself for myself. I had built a life like that. I had isolated myself from my friends and, uh, she didn't want the world to know because the age difference, uh, was you know a kind of a taboo thing and so i didn't tell my friends i was kind of alone in a world with her mm. and so not only was it hard from like an emotional breaking up kind of way but she had become i had allowed her to become my whole world gradually and i didn't even really have a world to go back to it was just kind of i was consumed by this relationship um, and so uh, yeah sucked where, where were you living at the time um i went to school in in santa cruz it was it was okay. there yeah uh, out in california yeah that yeah kind of, i'm still in california got it um yeah that's uh yeah this, this it helps me kind of put like visualize it a little bit more like i've seen that kind of relationship more in the spiritual kind of circles in california um I don't know if that was like the circles you were running in. Um, there was no circle to it. We just happened yeah. to connect. Neither of us planned it or expected it, but uh, we just kind of understood each other. And it was, uh, it was a good thing. Like early on, especially early on in the relationship, there were, there were a lot of signs that there was something special going on. Um, so I don't really you know, blame myself in that respect. It was an adventure and it was, you know, it, I, I think I played it wrong i think i you know yeah so um like in this eight years of downward spiral like uh where were like what were you doing would you call yourself what was your mental state like um like what was what was your life like um it's a good solid period of darkness you know eight, eight years That's yeah like a good solid night in the wilderness yeah um, I was pretty obviously depressed for maybe the first three or four years. I was pretty just dismayed and I couldn't stop talking about this and just, you know, it was just a pit of darkness and coping in all kinds of ways. And, you know, I still like scratching and clawing at the walls of this well as I fell down it, you know, I was trying to get out. And at a certain point, I guess I decided I'm 1000% going to hell. I might as well see what I can enjoy in this world before I do see what kind of life I can have uh, while I still have one and started to improve my life externally. I got a job. I went back to school. I was trying to have fun. I had some semblance of friends. Um, and things started to get better externally. I was still feeling like I was degenerating inwardly, but outwardly my life was starting to have the shape of a normal life. And um, I... Uh, in the course of this period, I reconnected with a young woman that I had initially met as a teenager. Like when I was doing the seduction community stuff, I was uh, meeting people on, you know, precursors to Facebook and stuff. And 
AOL Instant Messenger and practicing flirting with girls that I would never meet in real life and uh, and making you know little pen pal type things. And I reconnected with one of these girls that I had talked to all the way back then. Uh, and we hit it off and I felt... Um, I felt drawn to her. I felt energized by her. I was still just in this kind of horrific knot with my ex that I just like couldn't, uh, I, I can't even, it's, it, I can't even describe, I guess. But I, 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 ex I had no expectation that I would have the ability to like love again or love someone else. And this girl, I felt something with that I didn't expect to feel. Mm -hmm. um, the problem was she was living in China. And I, my one possession at this moment was a, a van, a really cool van with like couches in it and lights and stuff. And I would, you know, drive it around, but I was so broke that I was filling it up one gallon of gas at a time. And I sold this van and I bought a plane ticket to Hong Kong where she went to uh, take a vacation. So my first date with this girl that I had technically known for about 10 years was a week in Hong Kong and it went great. And now she's in the kitchen because we're married. And uh, she just giggled at the way I said that. There she is. Hi. And um, what was... You know, I don't really have great segues for this stuff because it's all just so nuts. So I'll I just mean, I'll just start saying things. Yeah, I mean, so far it's pretty nuts. So yeah, <laughs> I might as well keep going that way. Yeah, I just you know, I there's not enough commas and things. Anyway, uh, she was born and raised Christian. I was raised in Ohio as a Jew, and she was raised in Michigan as a Michigander, as you know. A, protestant christian her whole life and going to church and done done everything that i had not done in fact she was a frequent victim of my atheist rantings as a 14 15 year old uh online and i would go to church with her in china oh yeah i moved to china i lived in lived in beijing down the street from her we went to church together and stuff like that and i uh felt very distant from God. And I, I basically concealed this from her. I didn't tell her this whole thing about my inner state because it was just too nuts. And also I wanted to hide it. I thought she wouldn't like me anymore. And I, I, I had no faith that I would have a future. Why would I reveal this? I was really, I was really in a bad place. I had so I had so little faith that I could have a life or a soul or be good again, that I was frankly just completely deceiving her into thinking that I was on a spiritual path, just not really sure about Christianity, but, you know, I'll try it along with my other things and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I, I, acted like a Christian with her. I went to church with her. I got baptized in Beijing. And uh, I even, you know, got married in a Christian ceremony, which my dad didn't want, didn't come to because he was, he didn't want to see me married as a Christian. He didn't mm -hmm. mind me being married to a Christian, but he didn't want me mm -hmm. married as a Christian. But meanwhile, inside, I'm still in this eight year spiral of just trying to salvage some form of earthly existence and just morally corrupt really like I, I didn't murder anybody but i was deceitful to a you know pretty deep degree um do you want to like pause there <laughs> to <laughs> reflect this is like act three right so yeah so this is uh yeah. let's see so this is um just the the kind of a random I mean, not random, but very, uh, very uh, synchronistic and um, sort of Hail Mary here, uh, you know, sell, selling everything you own to fly to China. And for whatever reason, um, 
you know, this girl doesn't kick you out. <laughs> um, like, how are you, how are you making a, a living? How are you, uh, were you sponging on her? Were you, uh, did you find a job in China? Actually, I did. Yeah. I got a job in Beijing and I was doing, um, I was working for a corporation that does, I think they call it like a localization, but it's really mm. translating of technical documents. So the company that I worked for would take Alibaba's technical documents and translate them into English. And then my job would be to translate them from recently translated English to professional customer facing English. English. From yeah. English uh, to English. Uh, I, I wouldn't put it that way. Uh, just out of fear for my life, but no. yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had, you know, done a lot of writing and had been come, become good at nitpicking about little grammatical things like that. And so it was a natural fit. Cool. Uh, and okay. So inwardly, this is, this is a, a, a great stage that you set up. You just got married. Um, inside you still feel very dark. You still feel like you're worthless or trying to salvage something from life. Um, externally you have a wife and like a little life in China. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's a nice little tableau. Um, but I'm guessing, I'm guessing there's like one more act. Yeah, there's def there is one more act. Absolutely. All right. Um, just to, I mean, it's a heck system. of a story, you know, the, the, fl the flying to Hong Kong thing. It's uh, very romantic. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I've, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I just, I figured I have the money, I have the desire. There's not really anything, you know, preventing it. So let's just, you know, let's do it. Uh, I, the, uh, the, the meme that that actor became, you know, sort of iron weirdly famous for, uh, don't let dreams be dreams. Like yeah. I totally vibe with that. Yeah. Don't let dreams be dreams. Like that, how, how is anyone ironic about this? Don't let dreams be dreams. perfect advice. Mm. Um, so yeah. And uh, we had actually moved back to the States together. We got married in the States. Uh, I was only in China for about six months. She had been there five years. And uh, yeah. So now we're living in the States and what happened? I'm working in crypto. I'll help her Did you just say something? I'll help her oh yeah. Uh, I'm working in crypto and doing well, uh, working for uh, startups and CEOs that I really respect, just geniuses that I learned a lot from and felt really uh, blessed to be able to spend a lot of time around and just kind of absorb their wisdom and their habits and things like that. And I went to a conference in uh, Denver. And this was 2020, right around when COVID was starting to be a thing. And I met someone there who I really connected with on like a philosophical level. And I could tell that he heard me in a way that pretty much no one else had. And I was able to kind of share my background all the way back to like Ramana Maharshi. Uh, and we just kind of connected uh, deeply. And he taught me a meditation technique that I figured I would try. And I had already tried, you know, 11 million and five, you know, I, I tried everything I could find. And, um, you know, I just, he made me feel seen in a, in a, in a way that I was really grateful for and spent a lot of time with me. It was just, just very, very, uh, gracious. Anyway, I went back to uh, LA and started this meditation technique and it actually started to work it actually started to slow what this this descent it whatever it did it it acted upon the faculty in me that had been broken it acted upon the process that had been in a destructive cycle and 
having had many, many moments of false hope, I didn't tell anyone about this for a while. I didn't want to jinx it. I just did this meditation for uh, weeks and weeks and just being amazed that something was working. Something was actually helping. So you're kind of like in a, a bit of a hopeless space where when you start, right? It's like nothing's changing. Yeah. Nothing can change. And now it's, you're starting yeah. to feel, feel, feel a little hope. Yeah. I was starting to feel hope like this, this injection of hope was the first one to not go away hmm. after days, after a couple of days. Yeah. Do you, have, do you have some sense of like what the faculty was in you that was broken or spiraling? Like what, what, what uh, it? It, I can take educated guesses. I think it was something like the will. I think my will was broken broken i felt mm. uh i can i could probably write a dissertation on why i think that but it's kind of hard to hard to distill um and, and what, this, what kind of, what kind of meditation yeah. technique were you uh were you using um i i will i will explain a little bit with the disclaimer that i was in a unique situation and you know your mileage will vary i'm sure yeah um, but it was a mantra meditation that involved just repeating a simple word and focusing 100% of attention on that word. And mm -hmm. when the mind wanders, bring it back. So it was a very focusing sort of uh, technique. And there was no uh, you know, deities or divine figures or energies or anything involved. It was really just about focusing precisely on this on this word and also the the guy who taught it to me was very careful to explain um and this is actually this was part of a this was the first of of a of a three-part meditation technique what i just described and the thing as a whole is uh very powerful and he made very clear that before you try this stuff you should be sure that you don't have like underlying traumas that you're going to run into and cause crises because it digs stuff up kind of rapidly. And to the extent which after these first couple of months of, of toying with it, I haven't really gone back to it because it's just, it's really uh, potent. And mm -hmm. uh, at this particular moment, doesn't feel wise to play around with, even though I have a pretty voracious appetite for, spiritual pursuit um in, in any sense it's called it's called the cutting machinery and you can find find things uh, out there for it it sounds and, sounds a little like um what i know transcendental meditation where people will meditate on a mantra um which i've heard some people speak highly of yeah um the, the cutting machinery is is three parts. It's, I mean, I'm going to try very, try hard not to describe it well enough for anyone to actually do it because mm -hmm. that's just not for me to do. But there's the mantra part and there's also kind of a relaxed open awareness part. And there's a uh, accepting and feeling into the sensations of emotions part that arise. And that third part is actually uh, it resonated with me a lot because it was very closely reminiscent to something that I had started to practice and develop in my own way. And so I felt like this is kind of made for me, like he's talking to me in a certain way. Anyway, um, it's hard, hard not to go off on tangents in, in that respect, but, um, could you, uh, forgive me for yeah. 10 seconds? Uh, I sure. the, the sun's setting over here and I just want to turn on an extra light. Sure. You look fine, but go ahead. All right. Now that I have you all alone, let me tell you the real secret to life, happiness and everything. Oh, Shay's back. Okay. No, he's not. Um, it is. Always have enough chocolate to sustain you through a small illness. In case of illness, pour it directly into your face. All right, Mike. Thanks for filling hey. the space.
Hope it was pleasure. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I do what I can. Um, yeah. So basically I started to improve because of this meditation technique and I was blown away and like, uh, still pretty like timid about it and didn't want to tell anybody. I was just meditating hours and hours and hours and just like fire hosing myself with this, with this particular, uh, approach. And I fire hosed myself so hard that I almost broke something. I almost made, I, I almost started some other horrible, horrible crisis of kind of just mm. barely staved it off. And I over, almost overwhelmed myself and, you know, caused damage. I, I appreciate and, in this yeah. interview uh, talking and mentioning like the possible dangers of meditation and meditation techniques. It's like, it's something I've heard people speak about. And I think there's not much awareness of that, but you, you should kind of, mm, I don't know, certainly be, uh, be aware that there can be negative side effects to meditation. Yeah. Techniques. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, maybe at the end of this, I'll try to, collate uh i guess a bunch of advice from mm. having encountered some of these uh downsides and whatnot that'd be good yeah I'd, I'd, I'd like to because there are some things that i wish i had known and that took me a long difficult time to learn um so yeah i started to improve but then i almost had this almost had this crisis it scared the shit out of me and uh the guy who taught it to me said Sounds like what you need to do is see a therapist, which is a very safe practice. Uh, and you deal with whatever big trauma triggered this thing in therapy. And then if you still feel like it, you can try this technique again. Uh, so I started seeing a therapist. The therapist's advice ended up having a lot in common with radical honesty. So I started telling the truth again. It was hard. I... I had to explain to my wife how I really felt inside and what was going on and all kinds of horrible confessions that were really, really painful and difficult uh, for her and, and for me, but like, come on, you have to be sympathetic mm. to her in particular. I, I'm and, more or less, yeah. uh, uh, I wouldn't say I broke up with the girl because of radical honesty, but it certainly hurt our relationship. Interesting. I'd, I would like to have a, a conversation about that sometime. Sure. But I, I'm afraid I still have you know, a <laughs> yeah. lot to get to. Here. We'll, get, I wanna... we'll get through. We'll get through. Yeah. We, we have like 12 months left to go, but it seems like Pretty this much. was a, 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 a chunky 12 months. It really was. Chunky monkey, man. Absolutely. Um, we, yeah, I, I revealed to her the, the truth that I never, you know, in my heart, wanted to be a Christian. I just did it to keep her around because I couldn't bear the thought of being alone again. You know, I was like umbilically sustained by her in a way less healthy way, even than I had been with the previous girlfriends. And that's just how, you know, how it was. And she, uh, came you know she came through all that you know and she didn't leave and sometimes i felt like i had to leave because my last couple of relationships were me choosing woman over god basically and so i on more than one occasion like f tried to divorce her i tried to f like force myself to leave because i thought that's what I had to do to prove to God that I could choose him over a relationship. And that was extremely painful for her. And, you know, we, we went through a lot and, uh, she reached a point of, I guess about exactly a year ago, uh, where she, you know, accepted that I might, I might never accept Jesus. I might never become a Christian and she would always be one. And she had always wanted to marry a Christian and be on the same, you know, on that same page. And she you know, just accepted that maybe that wasn't going to happen because we were married and marriage means 
uh, for life and it means commitment. It means all these, you know, really serious things for her. And it didn't really for me. I, you know, marriage, people undo marriage all the time. It didn't really feel like a incredibly, you know, sacred thing. It's not something I'd ever thought about that much. And um, uh, about a week later, I was accompanying her with uh, at church and I was going through a period where I was noticing, you know, when I would, um, I guess, I guess I was fighting like laziness. If I was feeling lazy, I would say to myself, I will suffer this effort for you, God. I was just kind of practicing choosing various kinds of discomfort for God's sake. And while I was uh, standing with, with my wife at church, you know, the music was playing and I was thinking, you know, what's really keeping me from accepting Jesus and becoming a Christian? And I realized it was the humiliation, the feeling that I've been fighting this my whole life. I'm Jewish. It's the one sort of religious orientation that I've always felt was off limits and never really had a particular interest in, in the first, in the first place, uh, not, not to the exclusion of any other path that is. And, uh, I said, you know, I will suffer this humiliation for you. Oh Lord, if that's what, if that's what's necessary. And I felt, you know, a weight lift. And, uh, later that night, uh, I accepted Jesus. I said a prayer and, you know, did it with her. And there was a real spiritual experience to that. I mm. felt, I felt, you know, I had, I had been just terrified that it would somehow decimate my Jewishness and it just didn't. Mm. And I felt love. I felt loved. I felt I had, I had had an encounter with Jesus 10 years ago in meditation. So I knew he was real by this point. I forgot to tell that story, but I had met Jesus in a sort of, you know, ex meditative experience kind of a sense. So it wasn't like, it wasn't a blind leap. Um, and uh, it's been, it's been great. Like, so th this experience, yeah. um, I just kind of want to take some time. For yeah, it. please help, help me, help me, help me yeah. unpack a little bit. Well, so the, um, I remember you, you talking about your first kind of blissful experience, uh, way back in your teenage years, yeah. where there was like this letting go after a period of grief. Um, was there any, any similarities between that and your, in your, uh, this kind of experience of accepting Christ? Um, not really. Hmm. There was, there was similarity in the sense that there was a, uh, a moment of spiritual healing or improvement. Um, and it, it did feel profound, hmm. but, uh, I don't know if, to what extent uh, you think about chakras or whether they're like a part of your, the way you approach things, but uh, I'm aware of them. I, I don't use them okay. regularly. All right. Well, I had, I had studied chakras as a teenager and was using them to sort of orient. And one of the, I'd say the main thing that characterized the experience when I was 18 or 19 was that, uh, two or three chakras of mine that had been very close before uh, lower ones um, were just blasted open and mm -hmm. felt very peaceful and powerful and clear and wonderful. And nothing that uh, dramatic happened in this, in this experience, but there was a sense of of safety and of relief mm -hmm. from the state of, um, you know, fundamental. Uh, it's it's very very subtle to describe, but 
there, there was definitely a sense of, of relief and spiritual safety that hadn't been there before, but it was, you know, it was, it was pretty gentle. It was pretty gentle too. Mm. Um, but since, since then there's been a lot of growth and I felt uh, Jesus's presence a lot. And I have sort of used, I, I've, I've been regarding Jesus in a lot of ways as my guru in the sense that a lot of Eastern traditions would think of that. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's the advantages of, of having Jesus as a guru are innumerable. You don't have to kind of roll the dice with human gurus and, and some of them are good and some of them are not. Mm. And, uh, and he's, there all the time and uh i feel when i when i meditate and combine meditation with prayer and ask jesus to help me i can feel his consciousness spotlight like adding to my own adding to my own mm. if i'm looking at some dark spot in here and then i ask jesus to as well i feel both of us working on this thing um and that's not something that I had felt, you know, before. Um, anyway, ev Nate, everything I had, yeah, go ahead. It sounds like you have this really uh, felt sense of like the presence of Jesus in your, in your spiritual practice, in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's really there. Now, when you were talking about like the humiliation of being a Christian, that resonated with me. Um, when I converted, uh, I remember being like very hesitant to start hinting that I was a Christian on Facebook or um, anything like that. Uh, it felt like kind of coming out in a way, you know, like I imagine it's like, like I was like thinking like, oh, my network of relationships like are the status in that I have in my network of relationships is going to get readjusted mostly lower. Um, and, and I'm choosing this. Um, and, uh, and it was, uh, it was a hard thing to do, but also, um, there was something like warm about it in, in the, in that, like it was aligning, you know, outside with inside. It's like, I was paying the price, but, to like radically simplify everything it's like it was like yeah. being being purified in a fire or something like that it's like um that's how, how i would describe it yeah yeah um i've definitely benefited from uh having kind of a single point of reference because i've always felt like with my take what i like and leave the rest approach to all spiritual traditions at once kind of it's been like there's always millions of tools at my disposal well which ones do i use and what do i do and stuff like that and just being able to filter all of that through jesus really takes a lot of the decision making stress out of it and does does radically simplify the spiritual life and i still meditate a lot and and, and pray a lot and you know the routine is is somewhat uh, similar and the approach and the values are somewhat similar, but it is very, very simplified. Um, as for coming out, boy, do I feel that <laughs> I ripped that bandaid off right away. Cause you know, my parents, my dad, uh, he, when he found out I had been baptized in Beijing, uh, not knowing and definitely not caring whether or not my heart was in it. Uh, that was the most, pain i've probably ever caused him he was really really just stunned by that and not in a good way and so i was really afraid to to share to share this but i pretty much did it right away you know we were at at my parents house and i and i told them and it, it went all right and my dad said you know what i love you i accept you and now let's never talk about it again mm -hmm. and I'm okay with that outcome for the moment. Like that's, that's better than I perhaps could have hoped for. And then I went on Twitter and told 
a super abbreviated version of the story on Twitter and just got it out there to my whole professional network just immediately. I just ripped that bandaid off, just, you know, and that's how I dealt with it because I knew it would be scary if I waited at all. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a big moment. And I, I guess it, it, it kind of is part of your uh, way of dealing with things to be radically honest, to like push it out in the open, to not to, um, not to, to, to hide it too long. Like that's, it's, it's sort of part of who you are. Um, maybe, maybe I, not. I wouldn't give me quite that much credit, but I was, I was trying to rebel against the fear. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not, I mean, telling your story, there's clearly periods where you're like betraying yourself or not pushing it for a while, but it seems to be like when you don't know what to do, you come back to that radical honesty um, with yourself and with other people. And that seems to be like one of the tools that you have that you, you, you push through with. You're absolutely right. That's always felt like a very reliable thing. Now, I think it's, um, you know, I mean, it, it seems to me kind of appropriate that you would become a Christian because, you know, Jesus was Jewish. And, um, you know, when I look at uh, sort of Renaissance depictions of Jesus, you know, a lot of them look like <laughs> a lot of them look like you. That's funny. I tend to think of Renaissance Jesus as being blonder, but uh, that's true. I do kind of get that. I get, I'll, you know, I, I get people doing this at me in the streets. Every now and then. <laughs> wait, wait. I'm gonna pull. I'm gonna pull up a. I'm gonna pull up a quick. Uh, a quick, quick Jesus here. Uh, I mean, not entirely dissimilar. Um, anyways. Sorry, that's kind of a joke. Also, my roommate's right. making a smoothie in the background, and I'm sure it's loud enough that y'all hear it right now. That's perfectly fine. For once, it's not some, something on my side. Yeah. Uh, perils of living with roommates. Mostly fine, uh, but occasionally uh, someone makes a smoothie during your podcast. Um, so y you have this Jesus in your life now, and uh, you're you're going to church. Uh, is it is it a particular denomination or a Protestant or just a, a non-denominational Protestant? Um, it's non-denominational, and you know this. The cultural aspect of of Christianity is the most foreign thing for me, and has been kind of the biggest hurdle. And I'm getting I'm getting used to it, but I've I've never I've never been that comfortable in church. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a long, that's, it's, it's probably, that's probably the hardest, the hardest adjustment mm. is being a part of Christian culture and Christian circles and things like that. It's just, it, that's always been sort of the other, that's always been someone else. Uh, and so that's, you know, that that's evolving, but yes, it's, it's, it's non-denominational. Yeah. I feel like that's um, a very common uh, obstacle that people face uh, as new converts, especially if they come from an interesting or spiritually varied background where they did some real searching is that when they come into a church, they, they find like a cultural tension there where um, like there's a personality difference, I think, between people who sort of stay in the church their whole life and then people who come to the church at the end of a spiritual journey um, that it can be profound and uh, a little alienating. Um, at least that's what I found in my last interviewee found. And now you're talking about, uh, yeah. so it's a common theme. It, it, yeah, it, it definitely feels that way. And I know I, I would be able to speak more accurately on it. If I knew the details of everyone's life in my church, that's, mm -hmm. that's just kind of the general, feeling and there is that kind of divide um that sort of personality divide or orientation divide with a, a lot of people who grew up in the church yeah absolutely um, yeah yeah uh, i'm curious as to um how like having this new uh relationship with jesus uh affects sort of um your the the rest of the spiritual practice you were doing, um, uh, like which teachers you draw from or how you think about 
your spiritual path and like what happens next? Um, what does it affect like how you relate to your former mentors or, or how you go about finding mentors uh, in different spiritual groups? Like do you still go to the same ones or are you navigating them differently? I'm just curious as to how this has sort of impacted your, um, your spiritual yeah. path. Yeah. So uh, one of the threads that I did not realize was running through my life until, you know, this past year or so is uh, my mentors uh, as, as an 18 year old with the group where I met my first girlfriend in, like the leader of that, of that group was kind of a cult leader and it was kind of a cult in that the group was um, kind of had an exclusive, exclusive set of values and, and priorities. And it was not a cult in the sense that it was extracting anything from me, but we felt like a special exclusive group. And uh, that's kind of the same with followers of Dr. David Hawkins, who wrote the uh, Power versus Force book, which um, I can only recommend with, with reservations. But if, I mean, I don't even know what reservations to recommend. There's a lot of great stuff in there and a lot of stuff that might uh, be harmful in, in some respects. Um, and uh, my mentors, I've, I tend to be drawn to people who I perceive as special in a way that I value and that make me feel special by association. And I guess that sounds kind of shallow, um, but I think that's, that's, that's how it is. Um, yeah, so the way Jesus has, my relationship with Jesus has changed this is it's, I make sure that Jesus is always number one and I filter any mentor through Jesus rather than uh, the reverse. And if mm. there's some kind of uh, conflict or uncertainty, I lean on Jesus and maybe reach out from there. Jesus is always the home base, always priority number one, always influence number one, and everything else I make sure to keep secondary, uh, even if I'm very drawn to someone. And that's that's probably the most notable the most notable change that I'm kind of doing that now. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah it seems to be um, like you're sort of demoting the importance of like this specialness um, to like a secondary kind of importance and, you know, how, how well, I guess they, they seem to be um, portraying the virtues of Christ or something like that is more important to you. Yeah, how compatible I mean, they are with Christ. Yeah, it's 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 really that I'm making sure that I don't want to impress more, anyone more than I want to impress Jesus, because hmm. it's it's really about you know some some something like something like that. Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, if if you're if you're a bunch of psychologists in your audience, they're probably drawing all kinds of conclusions about me, which is probably fine. Whatever. If you think of anything good, email me, you know, bring it on. I could use it. Sounds good. Please yeah. do. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I'm cu curious, maybe you haven't come across this yet, but, um, you know, there's a lot of people that speak in the name of Jesus. Um, and a lot of people that want to teach you about living that speak yeah. in the name of Jesus. They say like, Oh, Jesus wants you to be this way or that way. Um, and I'm curious as to, as a non-denominational, uh, Protestant, uh, how, how do you navigate those waters when, where, how do you decide like who's worth listening to and who's really going to lead you closer to God, to love, to truth yeah. and, um, and, and who is, um, using the story of Christ to, to, for self aggrandize, self aggrandizement. Sure. Well, that, that's, that's an interesting and relevant challenge because despite being a Christ follower now, I have my whole history of spiritual influences and they put a certain lens on Christianity for me. And 
Christianity is now a, a, a bigger part of that lens. And Jesus, of course, has influence over that lens. But still, um, there's a continual negotiation between... I, I'm going through just this very conservative phase where I'm, I guess, just allowing myself to doubt my judgment more because typically I would have a very specific and kind of unique interpretation of something because I've heard, you know, Lao Tzu comment on it or something like that. I, I, I still have that, but I'm, I guess I'm holding that more loosely and uh, it feels it's hard to even say, but I think it's true that I'm like trying not to let myself think too much because hmm. the answer isn't a, about uh, figuring things out exactly right, but about the depth of the relationship with and trust in Jesus, because that's the thing that gets lived out. That's the thing that makes you different. And maybe I can, um, you know, write an insightful blog post on some Bible verse or something if I tried. But um, I'm going through this sort of paradoxical phase where after valuing and getting a lot of strength from what typically would get called independent thought, I'm kind of limiting, uh, deliberately limiting the independence of my thought to just try to stick close to Jesus and keep things simple and, um, and learn from the people and influences around me. And I, I bring up my objections and questions and, and have issues and all that stuff. And I, I wrestle with all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm no longer as like... Uh, as resolutely rebellious about it. If I have a different point of view, uh, I don't like feel the need to plant a flag and say, look at my unique point of view. I just kind of let it be and take time to negotiate it. And maybe it'll become important and something that affects the trajectory of my life. And maybe it doesn't, but mm. um, that's kind of that's kind of the big the big difference. That uh, it's just super weird and even sometimes uncomfortable to to talk about. But yeah, I'm kind of uh, proactively thinking less hard. Well, now that we've completely scandalized all of my techie, um, you know, uh, scientific materialist audience. Um, now I, I think. Um, it's true that like if you really believe in God and Christians, you know, lots of Christians say they really believe in God. But, you know, I think many Christians also do really believe in God, that the whole um, premise of Christianity is that it's a religion of relationship. Right. Like like it is fundamentally about that um, relationship between you and you and Jesus. And um, and. Uh, so so like having the right opinions on theology or um having the right you know finding the perfect way to meditate like these uh aren't it, it's not really the it, it, like finding the correct thing like religion's not christianity is not a scientific theorem it's a relationship um and uh and i almost think like buddhism is an easier fit for a lot of uh like post enlightenment Westerners, because it's more of a philosophy. It is more of a science of consciousness, right? It's trying to say yeah. like, this is the right way to think about things. This is the right way to practice. And if you follow this path, you, you get to like the truth that we're trying to teach you. And, um, and in Christianity, the truth is a person, um, and you're in relationship with him. And, uh, like that's the really the crux and the most important thing. Like, I, I don't know if you think of, your story here as having any hand of providence in it, but, but you could think of it that way um, as you being in relationship with Christ the whole time. And uh, certainly there's a lot of coincidences there that, um, you know, 
yeah, it could be. Yeah, um, ab absolutely. Absolutely. I'm open to that. Um, yeah. Where do we, where do we go from here? Uh, I got, I got like max 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, do you have any advice for, uh, for spiritual travelers, journeyers that are on their own path? Yeah. Um, Before, before I say that, though, I wanted to comment on what you were saying earlier mm -hmm. about how Jesus is a person or Christianity is a person, the truth is a person. And that sounded weird to me for a long time. Um, but when I think about... the different ways that various spiritual traditions have described truth as a thing that you cannot possess in the sense of knowledge that to know the truth is to live a truth to know a truth is to live it. It's a, a truth is a thing that you be a thing that you know by identification with it rather than like memorization of a string of words or something like that. And in that context, it makes perfect sense that if someone is perfect at being the truth, then the perfect instantiation of a truth is a being is a person and um just throwing that out there in case it's it's useful because it does actually kind of jive with a lot of the mystical non-christian influences that i had before and when i when people who'd grown up in the church would say to me you know, the, the truth is a person i know who the truth is not what the truth is or something like that it always sounded kind of weird um but in that light if you can mm -hmm. Just I, I'm 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 fascinated by that way of you know teasing teasing that out. No, well, um, I, I I love the bridge building there. And like like, like yeah. I, th I think a lot of Christian apologetics uh, sometimes they I think there's a lack of a Christian apologetics that are targeted at like I don't know modern online people. Uh, yeah, and you know what? I think I'd like to you know f foray into that. I, I, I'd I'd like to do that some more. Well. I, you know, one thing we could do is um, I'm doing this series of podcasts on people's like stories of coming into the church, but I, I kind of want to like bookmark these guests, uh, including you, to have a more general conversation just about, um, you know, not a narrative one, but talking over topics that are, um, you know, discussing faith and religion and how people are going about it nowadays and what you think they could benefit from. Like, I think we could yeah. probably fill a, another podcast full of, full of that. I'd be happy to do it. Um, I want to try to squeeze out a few drops of advice before we run out of time here. Since Sounds you brought good. it up, I've been thinking about it. Um, one is you'll probably read a lot that it's important to know the difference between uh, non-attachment and detachment. I was aware of this intellectually but did not realize the extent to which a lot of meditation often had a detaching effect a sort of dissociative uh effect so uh you know don't neglect the body don't become like you know a, a peaceful skeleton like mm. there there are there are ways of, of of balancing meditation in a way that are uh embodied and keep you in the world rather than a, a sort of half-assed escape from it um, that happened to uh, one of my exes. She did a lot of meditation and then, like, had some de de realization. Like, didn't feel real. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm sorry to hear about that. And I hope, yeah. hope she's all right. Hope she is. Um, the next thing is, uh, unconscious things are really unconscious. You really don't know they're there, mm -hmm. and they will mess with you, and you will do things that you do not understand and hurt yourself and you know it's 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 real like um oh where was i gonna go with this hmm, i had a very specific destination in mind i don't remember um well i think in, in like in your story you kept on talking about these downward spirals where you were like hurting yourself and it seemed like you know if someone walked up to you and said 
stop doing the bad thing and do good things like all right you know it wouldn't have been yeah all it's right. Like, why no, are I'll, you I'll, why are you doing the hurting yourself? Like you you wouldn't know it's right. it, or be so capable I'll, necessarily of just I'll, it, right? I'll share a thing. I'll share a thing. I hadn't I hadn't actually shared this with anyone yet. Uh it's when I thought of myself as having, you know, spirituality be my top priority, but on multiple occasions, uh, I chose something else. I chose a, a relationship instead. And The second, the second time I was talking to my therapist about this and he said, well, if you were so, you know, committed to spirituality, why did you so easily let go of your values in order to stay in this relationship? Seems like a pretty simple question. And I wanted to say, well, it wasn't easy. I hated it. I was very reluctant, very slow. And I fought her every step of the way. But, you know, in the end, I, I ended up relinquishing a lot of um, what I felt was important in order to stay in this relationship. And, you know, the answer was I actually valued, I was, I was using spirituality to heal something, to seek a healing for something that she was kind of giving me a bandaid for, for free without the work of that spirituality. So when it came to be a choice between removing that bandaid and keeping it, it actually was more aligned with my uh, I guess you could say relieving of pain to keep the band-aid there I don't feel like I'm doing a great job of describing this I, I guess I it guess makes sense the point to me. Is, yeah yeah I guess like, like there's the hard yeah. work of healing the wound or the easy sort of short-term solution of just not feeling the the pain from it and uh and you're choosing like the the latter and i i think if if there's any point i'm trying to make it's that uh we're we're only we're only honest with ourselves to the extent that we're honest with ourselves mm. and there's always further to go and if we pull up to the extent we pull up short, that's the extent to which we get bitten in the rear end. Mm. Um, and, you know, when, man, I really wish I could just go back 10 minutes and try this again. I feel like I've done a terrible job. I think you've done a pretty good uh, job. I, I, I've I, I, really I, enjoyed what you've had to say. Thank you, man. I really appreciate that. But uh, yeah. Uh, self-honesty, honesty, good, lying, bad. And, you know, I say that as someone with a lot of experience in both. Um, and uh, Jesus is safe, guys. Jesus is real. It's a real, real thing, really alive, really helps mm. you, really simplifies the spiritual path and accelerates it. And... Uh, If you're a, a Buddhist or a mystic of some kind, uh, as I was for a long time, the uh, the rational path is to get the best guru that you can and simplify things as much as you can, and that's Jesus. That's just how how to do it. I even realized this before I accepted him. Like, well, if I was being purely rational, the simple thing is find the best guru that I can, and the most most reliable thing that I can, and then and just stick to that and you know instead of having to you know sort through five thousand volumes of hindu texts just follow jesus and connect with jesus in here and in meditation and you're good and uh just cling cling to that it's it's it lives up to the hype mm. so it's, uh, it's been uh 
it was a really beautiful story. And it struck me when you were talking about uh, the night that you accepted Jesus, how you said it, that he was safe. Um, and and you, you just repeated that word again. Um, that's something that, uh, like, given the, the dangers of spiritual exploration, and I think there are, um, you know, people get sucked into destructive patterns that live a spiritual life just as easily as people that don't live a spiritual life. Um, you know, there's, there's bad trips, there's side effects to meditation. There's all sorts of, there's destructive gurus. There's, Oh yeah. And don't uh, do drugs. Don't do psychedelics mm, there. You know? Yeah. Like get everything on the natch. God, yeah, God on the natch. Yeah. There, there's, there's so many dangers out there. And, and just this idea that like Jesus is safe. You can trust him. Yeah. Uh, he was humble enough to die. Um, there's, you know, he's, he's ultimate humility and ultimate love. Um, like that's, that's a good foundation to have. And, and it's nice to have that safe Harbor. Um, when, when there's so much, uh, that's not so safe. Yeah. The, the spiritual world is a jungle as real as any physical jungle. And we are not equipped to go swing it through it. Just cling to Jesus and that's all that's all you need and like to the extent that you're really ambitious about spirituality that's you know uh, undoubtedly a wise bet well mike it's been a, it's been great to have you and thank you for coming on and telling your story um and may god keep you and may god bless your your journey uh in the future thank you very much it's been a pleasure